My name is Yulia Panfil, and I'm the director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America. This webinar is a part of New America's Aftershock series, and we're so pleased to co-host it with the Norwegian Refugee Council. As we sit here today, we know a war is raging in Ukraine and Russia's invasion has sparked a massive exodus. Nearly 5 million Ukrainians have fled the country and another 7 million at least are internally displaced and that number grows every day. Entire cities are being destroyed by Russian shelling. Right now, Ukrainians are fighting for their homeland and in many places their lives and the most immediate needs are for military support and humanitarian assistance. But there's another critical question that's emerging as it does in any conflict. And that is what we're here to talk about today. What happens to the properties of millions of Amer uh, that millions of Ukrainians are leaving behind and, that count and the countless buildings that are being shelled? When the day comes for Ukrainians to return and rebuild, how will they reclaim the homes still standing and receive compensation for the houses that have been destroyed? Today, I am honored to be joined by four experts to discuss the measures that policymakers must put in place right now to increase the chances of a successful post-war restitution effort and what Ukrainian refugees can do to improve their odds of reclaiming what they left behind. These experts are helping to think through these issues in Ukraine in real time. And I want to in particular thank my Ukrainian colleagues for taking the time to join. This is a difficult conversation because while it may sound sometimes like we're discussing laws and policies, in fact, we're discussing people. We're talking about people's lives and their homes. It's a difficult and personal subject, but for the reasons we'll get into during the panel, it's one that needs to be discussed urgently without waiting for the dust to settle. So I thank everyone for coming together for this conversation. I will now introduce our four incredible panelists. We'll talk for about 40 minutes and then we will open it up to audience Q&A. So please do drop your questions into the Slido box as we talk. First, I am pleased to introduce Vladimir Korbalaze, Housing, Land and Property Coordinator for the Norwegian Refugee Council Ukraine, as well as the Housing, Land and Property Technical Working Group within the UN Coordination System in Ukraine. Vladimir has spent the last several years working on housing, land, and property issues in Ukraine with a particular focus on the compensation and restitution issues that we'll be talking about today, as well as security of tenure, property records, and ownership documentation. Next, I would like to introduce Denis Nizalo, Senior Land Governance Advisor for the Prindex Project and a senior lecturer at DeMondfort University. Before taking this position, Dennis was the program director for the World Bank's program on supporting transparent land governance in Ukraine. Next, I am pleased to introduce Katerina Reznikova. She is the technical director of Blom Info Ukraine. Blom Info is a Ukrainian company that since 2004 has been developing GIS systems in the Ukrainian market, maintaining and filling land cadastral information systems spatial planning, and creating community resource management systems. Experts from Blom Info are included in most of the Ukrainian government's working groups for the development of new regulations and legislation, including property restitution. Katerina's colleague, Helen Lysenko, will be translating. And finally, I am pleased to introduce Professor John Unra, a professor of geography at McGill University in Montreal. He has over 25 years of experience in developing and implementing research, policy, and practice on land and property rights in war-affected states. He's worked in the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, and Asia for a variety of multinational and bilateral donors and NGOs, as well as country governments. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to start the discussion uh, with a question to John. John. Let's start with a broad international perspective to frame the issue. Typically, during conflicts, what happens to people's homes and property? What are the major things that you and other international experts worry about in these contexts? Thank you, Yulia. 
Um, well, apart from the unfortunate uh, destruction and damage and looting that goes on uh, to people's uh, homes and, and properties, uh, what we see is a, a broad collapse of, of livelihoods as, as uh, the, the various systems that support livelihoods, food, education, water, security, also collapse. And so there's a difficulty then with uh, returning home. Uh, one of the um, uh, primary problems that we worry about is that people, of course, depart. Their priorities are uh, getting through the day. Uh, frequently, they can either plan in advance, but most of the time, they simply run out the back door of their, of their house as, as a battle looms or, or opposing uh, forces uh, approach. What that means is that they very often don't take uh, evidence, documentation of their attachment to their housing, land, and property with them. And so they don't have it. If they do take it with them, they very quickly come to realize that it could be confiscated and used against them. So they can destroy them or, or purposefully leave them behind or erase them off their, off their phone. Their housing, land, and property can uh, also become trafficked, right? As, as we've seen in, in Eastern Ukraine with the militias uh, operating there. The reality is that there's a very narrow window um, uh, between which people become aware of what other non-documented uh, forms of evidence they have, be able to gather that, upload it to a platform, and then get it off of their persons as they continue to flee the, um, the, the theater of conflict. Not being able to do that, to, to grasp what attaches you to your home is a primary problem because uh, frequently, those that flee are not aware of just how easily it is to become completely and permanently disconnected legally, physically, from your housing, land, and property during war. Thank you. Thank you, John. Now, um, moving to Vladimir and Katerina, um, coming directly to the conflict in Ukraine. You're both on the ground right now, Vladimir with NRC, Katerina with Blaminfo. Can you describe what you're seeing? in terms of what is happening to the homes and property of Ukrainians and how the situation is differing from city to city? What are the biggest challenges that are emerging? And maybe we'll start with Vladimir and then move to Katerina. Hello, uh, I'm happy to be here, but my English is not at heart level. And I will ask my colleague, Helena to help me with the translate. Do you not mind? Uh, Елена Анатольевна, слышите, да? Катя, we have agreed, мы согласовали. Ага, окей. Ну, шановні присутні, я хочу донести до вас ситуацію, що нині відбувається в Україні з приводу прав власності на майно, в тому числі земельні ділянки. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to inform you about the current situation in Ukraine regarding property rights, including plant plots. Щодо ситуації з майном в містах, де проходять активні бойові дії, то більшість житла зруйновано або зазнала значних ушкоджень. Що ж потрібно зробити, да, які конкретні шляхи, щоб це подолати? На даний час важливо швидко зафіксувати ці збитки, оцінити витрати і почати виплачувати компенсації або відновлювати житловий фонд. What to do? What concrete first steps should be? Катерина uh, considers it is very important to fix uh, destruction, to estimate losses, and start paying compensation or rebuild housing as soon as possible. Але звичайно, що наразі основна проблема це адаптація існуючого законодавства до умов, що сталося. But for now, this is very important to make adaptation of existing legislation to the condition of martial law. Щоб всі наступні дії, які ми будемо робити з фіксацією руйнувань, з їх оцінкою, вже безпосередньо проводилися в полі в юридичній площині. In order that all other 
further actions of uh, fixing uh, destruction, evaluation of losses, payment of compensation, and other procedures were to place uh, at the uh, legal field, in the legal field. Однак не треба забувати, що на сьогодні Україна потребує допомоги в створенні тимчасового житла для своїх громадян. But we should remember that Ukrainian citizens who, who suffered from destroying of real estate uh, demands of building housing for them. That's all. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, moving to Vladimir. Uh, go ahead, Vladimir. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Um, I will try to answer your question in, in English. Well, first of all, about the situation on the ground. Uh, well, I would like to make it uh, as clear as possible that the situation is varies uh, significantly depends on the different region in Ukraine. So uh, I will personally uh, classify this area on three different types. Uh, the first one is uh, the areas with the light destruction or single cases of heavily destruction houses. Well, it is most common, this case is mostly common in Western and Central Ukraine and some big cities like Kyiv and Odessa. Uh, this area is actually, have ex has ex these areas has ex have experienced some, some single cases of airstrikes. Uh, so, but it didn't ha happen on a daily basis. So in practice, it means that you can found a few buildings, not always residential, which was heavily destroyed or damaged and such bigger number of uh, light damages caused by the explosive wave around. Uh, the, second, uh, the, the second type I would like to describe the medium one. So these cases is mostly common in settlements uh, in the northeast, east and south uh, Ukraine, well, and I identify three main factors which actually affect the level of destruction. The first one is uh, whether the settlements was um, located on the uh, occupied territories. The second one, whether the settlements was used uh, by armed forces on the for the transit manner, uh, matters or has been used for overnight stay. And the third one is strategic importance of the settlements, for example, like Kharkiv or Mariupol. So usually it means that it's such kind of settlements, you can find a lot of completely destroyed or damaged uh, houses. And I mean, including residential uh, with a huge amount of light destruction. Uh, and well, let's be honest, I'm not an expert in damage assessment, but on my personal experience by the medium level, I mean, the cities like Zbucha and Irpin, you might probably have seen photos of. And the last one, the third one is a heavily affected area. So due to different reasons, this area was um, unlucky to take the strongest, um, the strongest wave of destruction. I mean Mariupol, I mean those city Borodyanka in Kyiv Oblast, and I mean those numerous small villages on the way on the strategic roadways. So these settlements actually looks like it looks exactly like an image of the city after war in our head. So and also to 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 be brief and to finish the situation on the ground, I would also would like to complement what has been said by the previous speaker. The most of the these settlements has experienced really uh, strong um, issue with the lack of electricity, water, and heater and heating. Grocery shops are mostly closed due to the logistic issues, and some areas even now remains really hard to reach uh, due to the destruction of the local infrastructure. I mean roads, bridges. The mine contamination and um, unexploded ordinance of war remains a significant issue as well. So this is like to briefly explain what is the situation on the ground up to date. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, staying with you for just a moment, um, as we know, while the invasion that began in February is a major escalation, there's been a conflict going on in the Donbas since 2014. And that conflict has resulted in significant property destruction as well. Uh, and the Ukrainian government has already been addressing this over the last several years. 
So can you tell us briefly what has been happening with uh, property in the Donbass over the last several years? Uh, thank you for the question. Well, in order to answer this question briefly, I would like to say that for the first few years after the conflict has started in Donbass, the government was, the Ukrainian government has been deciding what is the most uh, effective and the proper way to resolve, to address the, how the needs of the conflict affected population. So uh, in, 2000, <clears throat> in 2019, it was a decision actually to, to launch the compensation program for completely destroyed housing. So Ukrainian context has already a successful example of the protection of the housing rights of the conflict affected population. I would like to say a few words how it was, the, the way how it has been done by the, by the government. The, first of all, the, the approach which was used is slightly different from those we've seen in another context. So uh, the government used a study uh, which uh, showed the average price for uh, obtaining a new house in the region. And they decided to provide those people, those house was completely destroyed with, them, with this exact amount of money which allowed them to buy a new house in the region. So it doesn't matter if your previous completely destroyed house was, the price for this house was higher or lower, everyone received the amount of money enabling them to buy a new house. And this program uh, was piloting in 2019, then in 2020 and 21, and actually more than 500 uh, households received the compensation and were enabled to resolve their, uh, their housing needs uh, before this escalation of the war in 2022. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 remarkable and you know it, it's unique that Ukraine uh, al already has a bit of a model uh, for the um, these compensation schemes because this conflict has been going on um, at a lower scale, uh, of course, for many years. Um, so uh, Dennis, moving to you, uh, as John mentioned, a major issue is often that property rights are not documented to begin with, or you know, uh, people don't have documentation or the registry doesn't exist. So after a conflict, it's difficult to sort out who owns what. Uh, but Ukraine is a bit different since um, the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 91, Ukraine has undergone extensive land reform. Um, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about the status of property rights and people's registration in Ukraine right before the invasion? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, the situation in Ukraine is uh, quite different than uh, you may imagine uh, in other uh, conflict-affected areas. Uh, and, well, we should uh, take a couple of things into account. First of all, uh, the property right, private property right, did not exist in Ukraine before uh, 1991 effectively. And uh, in the process of privatization, people were granted uh, property rights for their housing and for land. And most of these transactions are documented. So people have one or another form of the documents confirming their property rights. However, there is a big difference between land rights, land related rights and rights for housing property. Um, as you uh, know that Ukraine went through some major land reform just before the war and in preparation for uh, this land reform, for opening up the uh, agricultural land market, most of the issues related to documentation, uh, related to uh, uh, infrastructure for supporting transaction was upgraded. That means that uh, most of the documents and most of the rights uh, were present in an electronic cadaster, unified electronic cadaster, uh, which uh, included uh, close to 90% of the private property for land uh, uh, and uh, a large share of, uh, of uh, state land. So uh, uh, 
the, the, the land property was documented electronically and also in preparation, not all, but a large portion of it. And uh, one factor that moved this uh, sort of formalization process was uh, the rental market. Uh, as you probably know, most of agricultural land is cultivated under the rental rights. So uh, the agricultural companies had an interest to sort of secure their rental rights and they helped uh, landowners to document uh, the property rights to begin with, but then also they have documented uh, the rental rights in the state registry of, uh, of rights. So that's sort of um, a big picture of what happens with property rights for land. Um, uh, moreover, uh, many infrastructural things were developed and implemented before the land market was opened. So issues of unclaimed rights were addressed uh, in the legislation, for example, for the un unclaimed inheritance or unclaimed uh, privatization rights. So they, they were addressed in, in the legislation. Uh, things like remote sensing of land use were was imp implemented and tested for the entire territory of the country uh, right before the war so we have something to compare what happens after the war during the war with this uh, uh the, the effective land use uh, before the war uh, the situation is different with housing uh, even though uh, many people, most people have uh, some uh, confirmation of their property rights, in many cases, this documentation is in a paper form. And uh, unfortunately, before the war, we were not able to create a unified uh, cadastre for real estate. And each city approached this uh, in a different way. We have some cities like Kiev, like Lviv, which have established uh, um, very sophisticated system with all the rights and all the technical characteristics of property being documented. Uh, while in some other cities, particularly in smaller cities and villages, uh, this information stayed in the paper form. So that uh, leads to the risks that uh, when the war uh, star uh, started, many archives is under the risk of being distracted. And as uh, John has rightly mentioned, if people have lost any uh, paper evidence of their property rights, uh, restoring such rights may be a problem, particularly for the areas that were under occupation or uh, which were directly uh, on the front line. Thank you, Dennis. Um, John, moving back to you, what uh, typically happens to destroyed and abandoned properties once um, a war ends. Um, and then, you know, John, if you'd like to answer and then uh, I'll open it up to uh, uh, the other panelists if they would jump, like to jump in as well. You know, what, what do we foresee happening to destroyed and abandoned properties in Ukraine once the war ends? What would typically happen? Sure, um, I, can, I can start off. Uh, so typically what we see is uh, a large involvement of the international community assisting the government with what we call a, a large scale uh, housing land and property restitution uh, process. Restitution in this case meaning also compensation for people who cannot return to properties that are destroyed or, or damaged or who do not wish to come back. So even if you, your house is standing and you do not wish to come back, you're still due uh, compensation. Uh, part of the issue is that uh, we have an example like uh, Ukraine where the government is very able, uh, expertise is high, uh, significant progress was made prior to the war. Uh, still, there's the issue that no country, uh, whoever they are, is in a position to manage the millions of people that will be returning home uh, and filing claims and trying to get compensation and trying to solve housing, land, and property problems all at once. So, so imagine, imagine the large scale return that goes on, largely uncontrolled, uh, and people arrive at their property, it's damaged, it's destroyed, someone else is in it, somebody sold it, um, and, and so they have to go somewhere else to, to, to live. And so this is a, an enormous problem. No country can do this. And so the international uh, community does have a, a, a package uh, so to speak, where it can come in, establish a land commission, take all of the housing, land, and property uh, problems out of the normal court system, because it would usually just completely overwhelm that, put it separately, and engage in what's called transitional justice. 
The transitional justice is something that is short term, it's temporary. Um, that the justice part it do, does things like uh, categorizes claimants and then passes a single legal decision for the whole category. Uh, one of the primary worries here is that a government will want to uh, take on all of the many, many cases and, and look into them and decide them one by one. That takes decades to do. People become very unhappy, sometimes very angry that it's taking so long. And so that becomes a real problem. So, so the international community, the restitution process has a number of techniques that it can use to make this happen very, very uh, quickly for large numbers of, of people. Uh, so, so what we usually have is a partnership that goes on between uh, the international community that, that supports uh, 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 national uh, governments in this large scale restitution and compensation uh, process. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, uh, moving to uh, Katerina and anyone else uh, who would like to jump in after her. Uh, remarkably, we know that the Ukrainian government is already taking steps to think through the property restitution process after the war ends. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the government is already doing and um, in cities that have been uh, liberated already where the Russian forces has, have retreated, is that process already beginning? Я, по-перше, хочу сказати, що я погоджуюсь абсолютно з Денисом, і нам дуже повезло, що в нас є такі ці електронні реєстри і кадастри є, які дозволяють нам відновити наші права власності вже безпосередньо в електронному вигляді, хоча вони не всі 100% в електронному вигляді. I fully agree with Denis and uh, would like to confirm that we are lucky that we have electronic uh, system and the cadaster and uh, that uh, residents of Ukraine have got the right to renew uh, their rights to the property. Uh, also, their um, registers are not uh, complete on 100%. Однак наразі жоден з цих реєстрів кадастрів не працює і неможливо провести будь-які транзакції з майном. But now none of these registers are working and uh, there is no opportunity uh, to make transaction of regarding the, on the base of these registers. Хочу наголосити, що Україна мирна країна і досвіду життя в нас під час військового стану немає. I would like to underline that Ukraine is a peaceful country and Ukraine hasn't got experience living and existing at the process of martial law. І тому наразі дуже важливо адаптувати наше законодавство до умов військового стану. And uh, now it is very important to adopt our legislation to the condition of the martial law of the war that we can do. І наразі уряд нашої країни прийняв вже низку нормативних актів, які дозволяють нам регулювати якраз ситуацію з нерухомим майном в Україні. Our government has been adopting some regulation that will assist to resolve situation that we real estate in Ukraine. Перше це закон України, який нам дозволяє говорити щодо створення умов для забезпечення продовольчої безпеки в умовах воєнного стану. First of all, this is the law of Ukraine concerning the agricultural the law regulation, the use of agricultural land in the martial law. І даний закон якраз регламентує використання земель сільськогосподарського призначення в умовах воєнного стану, регламентує всі процедурні моменти, склад документації, умови, терміни і так далі. This law regulates the use of agricultural land in the martial law and regulates the some of the prestigious aspects regarding the Composition of land management documentation and others. 
І саме головне, що завдяки цьому закону наші аграрії вже змогли вийти в поля і почати посівну. Другий важливий нормативний акт – це постанова Кабінету міністрів України про затвердження порядку визначення шкоди та збитків, завданих Україні внаслідок збройної агресії Російської Федерації. The second main resolution is a resolution of the Cabinet of Ministers on approval of the procedure for determining the damage and the losses caused to Ukraine as a result of the aggression of the Russian Federation. У відповідності до цієї постанови визначені збитки, які поділяються на 15 напрямків. According to this regulation, the definition of damage and losses is determined in 15 areas. І вони поділяються від людських втрат, втрат майна і до втрат навколишнього природнього середовища. They are concerns from human losses to losses of property and to losses of the environment. За кожним з цих 15 напрямків визначені відповідальні міністерства, які мають розробити методику розрахунку цих збитків. According to this, according to each of these directions, of damages and losses, the ministries have been identified and these ministers uh, are obliged to develop calculation methods of estimation of damages and losses. І термін, який відведений нашою державою на ці роботи, становить 6 місяців. The term set by the Ukrainian state of the ministries to develop methodic for this field is six months. Активний процес фіксації, що стосується питання активного процесу фіксації руйнувань в містах, що вже визволені, на сьогоднішній момент не відбувається так активно, як би ми того хотіли. І причина тут єдина. Причина та, що наслідки військових дій не ліквідовані і є величезні ризики мінування території. The active process of recording the destruction in the liberated areas, city settlements, does not take, does not take place now. And one of the reasons of it is that uh, these are consequences of hostilities, uh, which have not been eliminated, and one of these hostilities is uh, mining. After, uh, uh, Katya, а ви хотіли ще додати, якщо я не помиляюсь, ви хотіли додати, що після закінчення розмінування, то можна вже приступити до робіт. Правильно? Так, так, так. Так, Катя, я хочу додати, що активний процес фіксування дістракції може починати одразу. The demining was done, will be done. Thank you. Um, Vladimir, uh, Dennis, I'd like to uh, give you an opportunity also uh, to answer this question. Um, uh, you know, what is the government already uh, doing? Should I start? Um, okay, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, Indeed, there are several things that are already in place and uh, implemented. For example, the government uh, has the active uh, instrument of identification or, and recording of all the explosions. What, uh, whatever happens on the ground, uh, there is a system already in place that records such, uh, such events. Uh, also, there are uh, several systems where people can declare the losses uh, including the one that is implemented uh, via the government portal uh, called DIA, where people can uh, sort of file the claim uh, for, for, for the losses. And there are uh, several other platforms uh, that were developed by various private developers where people can document, uh, provide evidence of the losses and which is used for assessment of losses. 
right however i would like to uh, uh, return to the point that uh, katerina has mentioned that effectively uh, now neither the registries registries of right uh, registry of uh, legal entities any registry and uh, the state cadastres they are not operational uh, they uh, they were evacuated from kiev uh, to a safer place however uh, they are not um, providing uh, support to the transactions as they should be in the uh, in the situation of peace uh, uh, so uh, and uh, that leads to several issues uh, which we have discussed with government officials that uh, they urgently need some support uh, for sort of restoring the services but providing the uh, level of cybersecurity that is necessary in this situation. But second, uh, if possible and where possible, uh, there are uh, needs for urgent uh, intervention to uh, digitize or to copy uh, the archives that were not digitized before the war in areas where it is safe. So that's something that is urgent, but then um, uh, we can follow up on these points about the development of methodology for loss assessment. There are also a couple of things that needs to be done. If may I to complement what was said by the by uh, the previous speaker, I would also just want to mention that if you mm, more a, a few actions more focused on the policy policy development was actually also taken by the Ukrainian government. Uh, for example, I would like to mention that mm, the draft law on the compensation uh, compensation slash restitution procedure has been already submitted to the Ukrainian parliament as has been successfully passed through first hearings. And now it is on the way to the second hearing in the Ukrainian parliament and uh, the member of parliaments uh, and other state agencies and, and all of the um, uh, non-profitable organizations has an opportunity to provide uh, the responsible ministry with the suggestions. Mm, with the suggestions uh, how this draft law could be amended before its final revision, final uh, final adoption. Uh, this is just short uh, short update also from my side. Thank you, Vladimir. And now I'll come to uh, the final two questions that I will ask, and I will ask all of the panelists to briefly answer. And I think you know, to me, these are the two most important questions of the discussion. So um, I hope that, uh, you know, uh, these, uh, I hope that you pay, pay attention. Um, the first is what can displaced Ukrainians be doing right now to ensure that they can reclaim their property once the war is over or receive compensation for anything that's been destroyed? Я, в принципі, погоджуюсь з тим, що сказав Денис, і перше, що потрібно зараз зробити українцям, майно яких постраждало внаслідок війни, причому незалежно від того, де вони зараз перебувають в Україні чи поза її межами, це зареєструватися через портал Дія. I agree with previous speaker Denis. Uh, and would like to, un to, un to underline that the, the first thing which Ukrainians should do is to register the damage at the portal, at state portal D of action in English. They can do it regardless of their location. And uh, but to do this, the citizens of Ukraine need to know information about the object that was damaged make photos and description of damage and own contact information. Can I jump in uh, this point? I think uh, uh, there is no need to invent a will. Uh, and I think what John has mentioned, uh, to make a copy of whatever proofs you have, uh, okay. that's uh, the safest uh, strategy. So we, we don't know when and how the registries and cadastres will be operational and what is there, what is not, and uh, how secure will be the copies of your documents. So if you have a chance 
to make copies, but not only of a title, but all the documents that uh, can document the technical characteristics, uh, that can document the rights that you have, uh, that needs to be done. And this electronic copy should be stored somewhere in a safe place. And perhaps just to follow up on, on those two very, uh, very useful uh, contributions, uh, from the international perspective, uh, what a, a land commissioner transitional justice process likes to see is corroboration. So, so you may have a document, um, but that document exists where services are destroyed, the National Archives may be destroyed, there's falsifications of documents. So it likes to see corroboration. Uh, so as Denny just mentioned, any photos, not just photos of your documents, but photos of your, your house, your property, uh, your family in front of your, your property, uh, school bills, electricity bills, anything that has your address on it, including interviewing grandmother or grandfather who has in their head the entire history of your house or your land and your property. When was there a drought? When was the price of bread high? All of these details, particularly that, that testament to attachment to place, that's very valuable for corroboration because those who are going to engage in fraud will not have that. And so corroboration is seen as very, very valuable. And, and so part of this is an awareness raising for people who are dislocated as to what, what is good for this, this form of corroboration. That, that's part of the challenge. And it needs to happen uh, fairly quickly. Thanks. Um. And also to complement what was said by, by the previous speakers, I just want to mention that Norwegian Refugee Council has a huge experience on providing free legal aid to Ukrainian citizens who were uh, seeking for a compensation in, in the previous in the period. So to summarize, yes, I would definitely agree. The first step is to inform the government on the destruction. It, it was already covered by the speakers. Also, if your documentation were uh, undamaged, please check if these documentation meet formal requirements to recognize you as a legal owner of the property. It's because of the complication of the legal system as was previously said by Dennis. And the last thing, it's also extremely important that e even if your documentation were damaged or destroyed, do not uh, take much of time to, uh, to uh, apply for a fr free legal aid providers in Ukraine. Uh, who can support you with the further legal actions need to be done in order to enable you to receive compensation in future. And also, which is really important, keep monitoring the, the situation with the legislation in order not to miss the opportunity to apply, to, to submit a compensation application or, or anything, uh, what every, anything else should be done uh, from legal perspective. Can I just add one more point, please? Uh, uh, to what John has mentioned. Uh, an additional piece of evidence that people can use uh, to uh, restore their rights is the uh, testimonies from people, from neighbors, from local authorities uh, that sort of uh, saw uh, the previous owners of uh, exercising their rights. So I think an additional piece of information that people need to have with them is the names and contact information of their neighbors and of their local government so that they can at least uh, ask for such testimonies if needed. Thank you uh, for providing those very concrete steps that Ukrainians can be taking right now and you know the sooner the better to um, document their ownership. So I'll come to my very last question. What can the international community be doing right now to help with this process? What are the biggest and the most urgent needs? Let me start and then another panelist will complement. Uh, well, uh, I would like to be really pragmatic and open with all of the attendees of today's our, our today's event. The first of all, let let be realistic. The, the what will happen with the compensation? There is three main factors that affect it. The first one is, of course, is political will of the decision makers. 
the second one is the financial capacity of the state and the third one is the technical capacity of the state officials to develop and design the proper compensation restitution mechanisms so of course i will not tackle the first one but Mm, more focused on the second and the, and the last one. It's about financial capacity. Uh, what could be done right now? The first one is to have a contact with the relevant governmental stakeholders who will be responsible for managing so-called fund for reconstruction of Ukraine, discuss with them their needs, their fundraising opportunities and support them in calculation of the financial resources required to provide restitution compensation. The third one is a technical, uh, the technical support for the state authorities. And I would like to share the, the, the experience of a Norwegian Refugee Council. Well, uh, when um, a few years ago, when we coordinated with the Ministry of Reintegration, we, we, we had a meeting and we said that you, we know that you have a political will to launch this compensation mechanism. Let us support you in design the exact mechanism how it should be done and they agree in that because you know mm, i'm i cannot say on behalf of ukrainian government but um, it is very very open government to work with uh, so if you have something practical them to offer in in terms of like how to establish proper state register of violated property rights, how to collect data on scale of destruction, how to develop efficient uh, and effective mechanism for compensation, do not hesitate to contact them. Uh, and I, I, I want to emphasize as much as possible that they are really open for the practical solutions, practical expertise and practical recommendations from international community, especially if it, it, if it will be linkage between this international community and national legal experts who can translate these solutions into the language of Ukrainian frameworks and policies and laws. This is my main recommendation. Okay, uh, if I may follow up then. Um, I would also uh, suggest that we consider uh, you know the the uh, the ways how the international community uh, can support Ukraine in this situation. Sort of, it, it, this recommendation can be in two groups. There are some urgent needs uh, of the government and of the people of Ukraine in uh, in terms of protecting property rights. That is related to uh, the uh, operation of uh, cadaster uh, and registries. Uh, uh, preserving the archives, uh, recording the damages and so on. So, however, the time is the essence. So if such aid can be provided fast enough and would respond to the actual needs, that is needed. However, if uh, this uh, any suggestion or any technology cannot be transferred soon enough, uh, that probably it's not a good idea to try to do something that would take you know years to implement right we may have uh, peaceful times for you know so something that is more time consuming however there is a second part of the uh, support that would require uh, sort of strategical changes and a uh, longer time for implementation. And that is related to methodology development, putting uh, together the infrastructure for uh, the restitution, uh, the uh, means for rehabilitation of land, for demining of land and so on. So these things will have to be ready by the time when Ukraine or any parts of Ukraine are liberated and uh, these things have to be implemented. So now we have time to prepare for this. And uh, I think that that is uh, very much uh, on demand. Thank you. Uh, perhaps just to follow up with those very good comments. Uh, uh, certainly agree from the international perspective. Uh, uh, now is the time to begin to prepare. So to those uh, uh, agencies, for example, within the United Nations that um, normally work on uh, restitution processes, uh, IOM, UN Habitat, even UNHCR, should right now be uh, familiarizing themselves with, with the authorities and the experts in, uh, in Ukraine uh, in order to try to, uh, try to uh, think forward. 
However, as Denise has mentioned, uh, there are very immediate needs. Uh, those needs would include assisting with the digitization of paper archives, uh, evacuating those paper uh, archives, um, and, and starting to engage in uh, perhaps uh, raising awareness among refugees and dislocated people uh, as to what constitutes good evidence. The risk here that we've seen in other, other conflicts is that people may have a lot on their phone but their, their world can shrink by and large to their phone. And so they begin to delete off of their phone very valuable information as opposed to uploading it first because they don't want to get caught, for example, with that material on their phone, as we've seen in Russia where phones are being confiscated and, and searched for, uh, for different things. So that's the risk, the, the risk of, of loss. Uh, so I would just, I would just support that. Uh, Quick digitization, if the technology can be provided and the assistance very quickly, uh, that's great, along the lines with, with awareness raising as well. Thanks. Тож, колеги, я для себе підрезюмувала наші такі висновки, які би ми хотіли отримати підтримку да, від міжнародної спільноти, і це звела в чотири таких основних класи підтримки. I summarize uh, the steps the the steps uh, which uh, international group uh, can assist Ukraine in restoring uh, citizens and property rights. There are four steps which I would like to tell you. Так, перше це створення експертної групи, до якої відуть міжнародні експерти з відповідним досвідом оцінки і фіксації руйнувань безпосередньо на рівні нашого кабінету міністрів. Establishment of an expert group at the level of the Cabinet of Ministers Ukraine, uh, which uh, expert groups should include international experts uh, with relevant experience of uh, assessments. І дуже важливо, щоб ті експерти, які приймали участь у розробці методик розрахунку збитків, розуміли, що методичні підходи мають базуватися на простих і доступних механізмах. And it will be highly appreciated that, uh, ex that expert group and the, the experts themselves made the methodolo methodological approaches uh, which will be based on a simple and accessible calculation of the risk. Друге, це на основі цих методик розробити відповідний інструмент, який буде дозволяти фіксувати руйнування із застосуванням сучасних технологій лідарної зйомки, фото-відеофіксації і так далі. Based on the development calculation methods, it's necessary to create and maybe the geographic information system for fixing damages and uh, which system should be recorded and calculate the methods of compensation for losses in each industry separately. It can be used uh, measurement, photo fixation, scanning and others. Третє – це те, що на сьогоднішній момент потрібно створювати фахівців, да, бригади фахівців, які здатні це фіксувати. Тобто мають бути створені мобільні бригади з відповідним обладнанням, які будуть робити цю фіксацію. Тобто це мають робити професіонали. Uh, of professionals uh, with different spheres of work, which can estimate uh, losses and damages at local place. І останнє це звичайно протестити цю методологію на одній двох територіях, які можуть бути обрані в Україні для пілотного проекту. And to test. Uh, the work of mobile groups for estimation of local damages and losses and to, to do these pilot works in two free selected communities or cities, maybe towns, not cities, of course. Thank you all. Um, uh, so we have time for just one 
uh, question. Uh, many of the questions that have come in have been answered through the course of our conversation. Uh, so we've had a couple of questions related to properties um, in Crimea that have already been expropriated and what's happening to properties that had been expropriated in Crimea. If um, somebody would like to just jump in and provide a brief answer uh, to that question, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can try to respond so my colleagues would like to. Okay, I will try to respond and then if somebody has something to complement, please go ahead. About the Crimea, you know, the, 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 until this escalation of the war, uh, there was no compensation mechanisms for the property which was expropriated in Crimea. And also, um, in addition to Crimea issue, the expropriation of property has started since this summer in non-governmental control area in Donetsk and Luhansk oblast as well. So the, the, the measures which uh, were taken by the government is actually the non-recognition of any legal actions related to the, uh, to the property located in Crimea or in non -governmental, another non-governmental control area if these legal actions are not followed Ukrainian legislation and are not recorded in Ukrainian uh, legal registry. So this is the answer what is happening in Crimea property and in other property, immovable property located in non-governmental control area. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Well, um, with that, uh, I would like to thank our panelists um, and the audience uh, for tuning in. And I'd just like to close by um, addressing my Ukrainian colleagues and anyone tuning in uh, from Ukraine directly. Сьогоднішній uh, час це темний та страшний час для України, але разом ми будемо чинити опір. Ми переможемо і ми відбудуємо нашу Україну. Слава Україні! Thank you, everyone. Героям слава! Героям слава!